Uh, today we heard about olfactory information processing and how olfactory information can change behavior. We learned about how reward uh, reinforcement learning can influence behavior leading to habits. And we've heard a lot about connections between biological entities and I'm going to continue that, um, that discussion with my talk here. My, my lab is interested in the neurobiology of social relationships. Okay? And I think everybody here knows the importance of social relationships, how if they're disrupted they can really have devastating impacts on our lives. But I'm also interested in how do those relationships form? How do they evolve? And in humans, we have several different kinds of relationships, some of which are very evolutionarily very ancient. So for example, the relationship between the mother and the offspring, this is something that you find in all mammalian species. But humans also have different kinds of relationships that you don't typically find. For example, uh, there's a relationship between, that forms between the mother and the father. This occurs in what we call socially monogamous species. Only three, three to five percent of mammals maintain a relationship between the mother and father after ejaculation. For the most part, they have sex, that's it. The male is off to find another female, the female raises her offspring by herself. Um, so you can understand a little bit about the neuroscience of things like social behavior by doing brain imaging studies, but if you really want to get down to the neurobiology and the neural circuitry, you've got to have an animal model. And these are the animal models that I've, that I've been studying. These are called prairie voles. Like humans, these are one of the 3% of mammals that form these lifelong attachments where they raise their offspring together. Um, and uh, if, if one of the pairs die, often the other one never takes on another mate. Um, now we say these guys are socially monogamous, which means that they form this lifelong relationship, but they're not sexually monogamous. So if a male prairie vole is wandering through the prairie and another female prairie vole comes by and she's in estrus, he may actually mate with her, but the important thing is that he comes back to his partner at night. So what we're studying here is the biology what we're studying here is the biology of social relationships and not monogamy as, as we often think about it. Now, to me, it's an interesting question. 3%, 3 to 5% of mammals are monogamous, but they're not all related. So monogamy, this complex kind of social behavior, had to evolve multiple times. And I'm very interested in how do you get evolution of new behaviors? And I think we've gotten some insight from the bowl system here. I believe that pair bonding evolved, evolved from tweaking of the mechanisms that are present in all species for promoting the bond between the mother and the offspring. Okay, so all mammals do this, very few do that, and I think simply evolutionary tweaking of those systems. Now why do I think that? First I want to talk about a molecule called oxytocin. This is a neuropeptide that's produced in the hypothalamus and it's released into the bloodstream, particularly around the onset of labor. Physicians use oxytocin to induce labor, it causes uterus contractions, so it's promoting birth. Also, once the baby is born, the baby begins to suckle, nurse. That sends signals back to the brain. Oxytocin neurons fire, and it binds to receptors on the, in the breast on smooth muscles that cause the breast muscles to contract to eject the milk into the baby. So it's required for reproduction and nurturing of the offspring. But we also know that it's acting in the brain. It's acting in receptors in different locations in the brain to create the desire for the mother to nurture the offspring and also to bond with that particular offspring. So, for example, rats, virgin rats, if you take virgin female rats and put a pup in the cage, they find the pups very annoying. They'll try to bury them, maybe they'll eat them. But when they go through birth, birth there's a transformation that occurs, so then pups are very attractive. And you can inject oxytocin into a virgin female rat, and she will do the same thing. In lambs, it's actually interesting because um, in, uh, in, during sheep breeding season, lots of females are giving birth at the same time. Lambs are able to walk around immediately after they're born. So the female not only has to be transformed and say, oh, I like lambs, but she has to, within just a few minutes, bond selectively with the odors of her own lamb. And, and um, this is, is, we know, is mediated through the oxytocin system. Now, I just want to highlight this uh, positive feedback thing because it comes up later uh, to be important. Vaginal cervical stimulation that occurs during the birthing process sends neural signals back to the oxytocin neurons and causes them to fire more. So you get more release of oxytocin, which therefore you get the progression of birth. When the baby suckles the breast, neurons go back, cause these neurons to fire, get more release of oxytocin, a positive feedback system. So given oxytocin's role in the bonding of the mother to the baby, Sue Carter and Tom Ensel around the early 1990s thought, thought that 
maybe oxytocin is involved in the bonding of the female to the male variable. Um, so what they did was, uh, she developed, Sue Carter developed this partner preference test. This is how we look to see if the animals have formed a bond. We put the animals together, let them cohabitate. We can arrange it so they don't, that they don't mate or they do mate. We can give them drugs during this time to interrogate the neurochemistry of the system. And then we separate them and then we put them in this three-chambered apparatus. And here, we, here we're asking whether the female is bonded to the male. We put the male partner on one side. He's collared. He can move around here, but he can't get out. We put a novel male on this side. He's collared, can't get out. And we drop the female in the middle. And we just watch for three hours and see who they spend their time with. We use computer-based um, behavioral analysis system. And uh, if, if they formed a pair bond, they'll spend more than twice as much time with a partner than a stranger. And I'm going to show you a video. This video is actually of a male in the middle. This is this female that he spent the night with the night before. Um, and the, the uh, a novel female here. And what we found through the, th this kind of system is that mating facilitates partner preference formation. The act of sex facilitates it. So actually, whoops, I forgot how to push this button. It stops the video. So what happens in a male prairie vole, unlike most other species, that when he bonds with a female, he becomes develops selective aggression towards other Females. He doesn't like other females, so he's going over to see this stranger after spending the night with his partner, and he doesn't like her. He behaves very differently to her than he's going to behave to his partner. So you see it's a very um, simple behavioral test, and we do this with 30, 40 animals at a time, all and analyzed by a video image analysis. So again, as I mentioned, Sue Carter and Tom Mitchell thought maybe oxytocin was involved in that process. So they took, did a simple experiment where they took female virgins, infused them in the brain with either CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, or oxytocin, and placed them with a male but did not allow them to mate. And they found that if, in the case of no mating, if you infuse oxytocin into the brain, you've got the animals develop this partner preference. If you infused an oxytocin receptor antagonist to block the receptors, and you allowed them to mate, you prevented pair bond formation. So here's one molecule that plays a critical role in the formation of a bond between these two animals that are mating. Now, one of the very cool things about the prairie vole system is that there are different species of voles that look almost identical, but their behavior is very, very different. So the prairie voles I already showed you, that not only are they monogamous, but they crave social contact. They, they uh, spend a lot of their time interacting with each other, grooming each other, and the males help rear the offspring. But we also have species like the meadow voles, which look very similar, but they're pretty much asocial. They don't care about interacting. They come together, they have sex, they fight over territory, but other than that, they don't care about each other. The males never have anything to do with the females. The females have abandoned the babies after a couple of weeks, but they're able to survive. So it gives us an opportunity to look in the brain and see, as well as the genome, to see what is different between these two species that have very different behaviors. Now, given that oxytocin is promoting the bond between the animals, we thought that maybe the difference between the monogamous species and the non-monogamous species is that the prairie voles have a lot more oxytocin. But if you stain the brain and you look at the oxytocin neurons and the fibers, how they're distributed in the brain, there's no difference between the two species. But what is different is the location of the receptors for the peptides. So this is receptor autoradiography, a slice of the brain. This is nucleus accumbens, prefrontal cortex that we heard about before. And what we find is that the monogamous species, these, these regions have now become sensitized to this molecule that's released during social interactions and vaginal cervical stimulation. Metal voles are not. These are kind of like mice. Mice have no receptors there either. And we can do site-specific infusions of antagonists, and we show that if you block the prefrontal cortex or the nucleus accumbens, you prevent the formation of this attachment. Okay? So these areas are involved in reward, reinforcement, addiction, habit, and we also find that they're involved in formation of the pair bonds. Um, we can do microdialysis experiments to monitor oxytocin releasing these animals. Uh, this was a put the probe into the nucleus accumbens, and the point of this is that under basal conditions when the female is alone, there's very little oxytocin, but when she's mated, and these guys, when they mate, they mate 20 or 30 times in a few hour period, lots of vaginal cervical stimulation, and we can see the result of that, which is oxytocin release into the brain. Now, so this, uh, <laughs> have some interesting speculation related to this, in that 
Human sexuality is different from most other species in two ways. First of all, most other species, females are only interested in sex at the time they are fertile. Sex is only to reproduce, and humans, sexuality probably plays another role in formation of bonds. And we're the, also the only species in where the organ that evolved to provide nutrients to the offspring has also become the fa fascination of the males and stimulation of the breast as part of sexuality. So if you think about it, human sexuality, I think, has evolved to recapitulate the physiological stimuli of birth and nursing. You have frequent vaginal cervical stimulation with the largest penis in the primate and all primates, and you also have breast stimulation, I think, to activate this bonding circuitry. Now, in males, vasopressin also, I mean, sorry, oxytocin may be important, but we know that another molecule called vasopressin is, it plays an important role, a more important role. This is a neuropeptide as well. It differs from oxytocin only by two amino acids in invertebrates that originally was a single gene that became duplicated and now gained these different functions. Vasopressin is interesting because of its sexual dimorphisms. Male have, males have much more vasopressin within the brain than do females. And if you look at what vasopressin does in other species, it's involved in territorial behavior, aggression. You take a hamster, you inject vasopressin into a brain of a hamster, it immediately starts scent marking everything in its territory. It's a territorial, macho, male, macho kind of behavioral regulator. But in prairie voles, it does induce that aggression, but it also stimulates the formation of that pair bond. So this has some interesting uh, implications for sex differences in the nature of the pair bond in that female bonding to a male may have evolved from tweaking of neural systems that are involved in nurturing. It's a very nurturing kind of bond. But the male, the evolution of the male bonding to the female came through tweaking of systems that are involved in territorial behavior. So maybe for a male, the female is an extension of his territory, and it's using those same neural systems. So again, we investigated what is the difference between these prairie voles that can form the bonds and the metal voles that cannot. And if you look again at the vasopressin distribution, you see no differences at all but, you know, between the, where the peptides are. But if you look at the receptors, you see a lot of differences. So for here again, this is a ventral pallidum. This is just um, ventral to the nucleus accumbens. Prairie voles have lots of receptors there. Metal voles have none, or very, very little. And if we infuse oxy, uh, vasopressin receptor antagonists into various regions, we find that only if we block these ventral palatal air receptors do we prevent the male from bonding with the female. Okay, so this is how we identify the circuitry that's, that's involved in this. Now, let's think about, I told you that these two molecules play key roles. What is it that they really do? They're not just bonding molecules. What we've found by studying mice and of social learning, olfactory learning in mice, is that what both of these molecules do is make social stimuli more salient. And for a mouse, that, or, or for a rodent, social stimuli usually means olfactory information. If we take, uh, there's a test called um, social recognition test. It's lo basically looking at olfactory learning. You have an experimental animal, you expose them to a stimulus animal, and then you quantify how long they sniff each other. You do that over and over and over again, you get a nice decline, you get, they habituate. They, they remember that odor. They remember that individual. It's a comp whatever the complex set of odors that makes that individual unique. Very much like each one of us has a unique face, each mouse has a unique set of odors. If you don't have oxytocin, um, so wild type animals show the nice decline. If you don't have oxytocin or vasopressin receptors, they don't show this decline at all. So. Uh, this and several other experiments tells me that what oxytocin and vasopressin are really doing is making the brain pay attention to social stimuli, okay? Um, if you do the same sort of experiment where you scent an animal with lemon scent or almond scent, non-social stimuli, they can habituate just fine. It is really telling individuals apart. So oxytocin and vasopressin are involved in perception of social stimuli. We also know that dopamine is important. If you block dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens, Males or females will not form a partner preference. Opiates, if we block opiate receptors in the dorsal caudate, the animals cannot form a partner preference. So all of these things coming together, yes, coming together, and this is my animal model of, of what I believe is going on in the brain. So when an animal mates, let's say this is a rat, non-monogamous, he's a rat, male rat, maybe he's having sex, he's got, vag he's got a genital stimulation coming into the brain. It activates this VTA area that we know projects to this prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens, releases that dopamine, opiates are released, and that's rewarding. It feels good. And we know that even for a rat, 
sex is rewarding because you can get a male rat to press a lever many, many, many times to get a female to drop out of the ceiling. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> so when it, when it feels good, that rat says, you know, imagine a virgin rat, male rat, he does it for the first time and it feels really good. He's like, man, what did I just do? He smells, he smells that this is a female that's in estrus. He smells like a particular way, different from other females that are not in estrus. He learns from that and he spends the rest of his life trying to regain that experience. And maybe Prairie Voles, it goes a little bit step, step beyond that. They're also breathing in that information. But now they're, but they have in these nucleus accumbens and ventral pallidum, these receptors that are involved in processing of social information. And so they have a much higher resolution of the olfactory signature. And so they're now are not just saying, oh, that's a female in estrus. They're saying, who was that? What individual was that? And so now they form an association between that reward and that pleasure and the odor of that individual that they're with at the time. And so from then on, they want to be with that individual. Okay. Um, one sort of um, corollary of that is that the reason that metal voles cannot form the bond is because they don't have the receptors in the right place. So we actually tested that hypothesis that maybe you can really transform behavior simply by rearranging receptors using a viral vector. And we put... Um, we, we cloned the vasopressor receptor from prairie voles, put it into a virus, and injected it into a metal vole. This is a control metal vole a viral vector injected. So now we simply made this ventral pallidum sensitive to vasopressin that's released when the animals mate. And we asked, are these, are these animals now able to form a partner preference? These males did show a partner preference. So I believe that a partner preference in prairie voles is, is just very much like conditioned place preference. It's just an association, but it's an association of, of reward with an individual. Um, oh, I'm not sure. When do I need, when do I need to finish? I forget. Um, so this, this suggests, the data that I just showed you suggests that genes, single genes acting in single brain areas can have a really profound influence on behavior. Okay? And that changes in gene expression can, can have an influence on behavior. Because they're acting on, they're modulating the way neural systems that already evolve for other purposes respond. It's this reward system that's already there to uh, help the animal adapt to many different kinds of behaviors. But we also know that experience can be important. And I'm going to show you a couple of experiments that we've done looking at that. Um, here we ask, what happens if you vary the amount of, of um, say, nurturing that an animal gets in early life? How does that affect its later life behavior? So we did this sort of daycare experiment where we took the pre pups the first two weeks of life and placed them in little... Um, isolation chambers for three hours per day for the first, first two weeks of life. After that, we, um, th we treated them exactly the same as we normally do. We had controlled animals that did not get this early life separation. So it's creating a, a, a period of, of is social isolation. And then we let the animals grow up, and we see how that affected their ability to form bonds later in life. And um, this shows that the control animals that we did not influence, that, that we didn't mess with, they spent much more time with the partner and the stranger, so they formed the bond normally. But the animals that had that early life neglect for the first two weeks of life had a much more difficult time forming a bond. When we looked at it more carefully, what we realized is that, first of all, there's a lot of individual variation in the amount of expression of this oxytocin receptor in this nucleus accumbens, so that some prairie voles, these are all prairie voles now, but some prairie voles have low levels of receptors and others have high, higher expression of receptors. And if you break the data up based on this, what you see is that the animals that have low levels of nucleus accumbens expression are totally severely impacted by this early life isolation. So they're susceptible. They're very susceptible to early life social stressors. But the animals that had the high densities of receptors were totally resilient. It had no impact on them whatsoever. So here we've got a brain expression difference between two groups of animals that somehow predicts susceptibility or resilience to early life stressors, social stressors. Now, this is bringing it back to the human. We did a similar kind of study in humans where we, um, worked by Christine Heim and Charlie Nemiroff at Emory, looked at women who are, were adults, uh, but early in life experienced various kinds of abu abuse and neglect, and we took cerebral spinal fluid to measure oxytocin levels, and we see that early life experience in women can impact the adult levels of oxytocin in the brain. So this is relevant. So to me, this is a really cool finding. This is, you know, here's 
two animals of the same species that have different levels of expression, this animal is totally resilient to this early life social isolation. This animal is totally susceptible. So um, we're trying to figure out what is what causes that. And what we found is that there is actually a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism in the oxytocin receptor gene that predicts the level of expression of this uh, receptor gene in the striatum only. So I want you to look at other areas. Throughout the brain, if you look in any other area, these two genotypes, the level of expression is exactly the, the same. But here is a polymorphism that seems to predict very strongly the level of expression of this gene in an area of the brain that is involved in social relationship formation. To me, that's really a, a cool finding. Um, this, was, this work was actually done quite a long time ago, um, but I was interested when I first started working with this system is, is, is what is the molecular mechanism that give rise to the species differences in expression, right? It comes down to a difference in expression level of this gene in this brain area. So I sequenced the gene for vasopressin receptor between the meadow and the prairie voles and found that, not like you would expect, throughout the gene they're about 99% identical until you get into the promoter of the gene. Um, there was a element called a microsatellite element that was about 350 base pairs longer in the prairie vole than was in the meadow vole. Uh, this is a highly repetitive piece of uh, stretch of DNA that tends to be unstable over time. So I thought maybe this is a, 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 this is a mechanism of pr producing variability in expression that then can produce variability in behavior, which natural selection then can, can then act on. And since then, we've created mice with where we've uh, knocked in the, the, um, the perivole vasopressin receptor promoter into the mouse genome and switched out different microsatellite elements to show that these things do regulate expression. But one of the cool things that we found is that because these things are unstable, uh, in our colony we had some animals with long microsatellites and some animals with short microsatellites. So it gave us an opportunity to say, is this little stretch of DNA in front of this gene that we know regulates behavior, is it producing variability in behavior. So we did breeding experiments where we bred short, long longs and short shorts, and we found that microsatellites, animals that had long microsatellites had more expression in some areas than short microsatellites, and it also predicted whether they would be able to form a bond or not. So now we've got a stretch of DNA in front of this gene that predicts whether the animal will be able to form a bond with a female or not. Um, I'm just going to go through this really quickly because this is also very interesting. This is looking at what happens if you lose a social relationship. You break that bond. We did a test where we took males and females, and well, we took males and either paired them with a sibling, so there was two in a cage, or we paired them with a female. In this case, they formed in a bond. Then we either kept some of them remain paired or some of them separate, and then we tested them on behavioral tests. Both the, this group and this group were socially isolated for the same amount of time. And we looked at tests, behavioral tests of despair and depression. One test called four swim tests where you put them in a beaker of water for five minutes and you see how long do they struggle to get out. An animal that has been stressed out in some way uh, will not struggle for very long and they'll just float. Um, animals that were separated from their sibling behave exactly the same as if they were paired with their sibling. But if they had been separated from their partner and put in this water, they, they showed this despair behavior. If you did another test called the tail suspension test, the very same thing. So these animals are behaving in a way that doesn't seem very adaptive. Um, also, their stress levels go, the corticosterone levels go high, CRF levels go high. And we found that. Um, if we block oxy, uh, CRF receptors in the brain at the time that they lose their partner, they do not experience this. So this is, what I told you before about oxytocin and vasopressin and dopamine, this is all the formation of the bond. Here we're talking about what happens when you are separated from your partner. Um, I won't go into this, but I think that this is evolutionary adaptive because it is very analogous to withdrawal. What happens when a junkie is without his drug? He'll, he does whatever he can to get that drug. When he's without his drug, he has increases in CRF, and CRF receptor antagonists are, have been investigated as a way of, of, of reducing 
uh, your cravings. And so I think here's the same thing is that the brain has evolved a mechanism so that when the, the animal is, is away from his partner, it fe feels a very aversive feeling. His adrenals grow larger, very stressed out, and he does whatever he can to find his partner. And in the case when his partner is actually dead or gone, um, it results in depressive-like behavior. So now I just want to quickly turn to Think, talk about the relevance of what we've learned in the voles to humans. Are similar kinds of things going on? Um, these are a couple of studies that were done by uh, Hasse Wallam, who's now a postdoc in my laboratory, but he did these studies while he was in Sweden, looking at people in live-in relationships. So he was looking at pair bonding in humans, and he looked at the vasopressin receptor and their microsatellite in the front of the vasopressin receptor in humans, and found exactly the same thing that we found in prairie voles. The length of this microsatellite predicted the relationship quality of the humans, but not in females. Uh, but he also found that the oxytocin receptor gene polymorphism of SNPs and the oxytocin receptor gene predicted pair bonding behavior in humans. Uh, this is uh, published last year in Biological Psychiatry. There's been, after the work that was done in, say, maternal behavior and some of the early work with prairie voles um, bonding, people have begun to ask, what does oxytocin do in people? And we can't do cannulations, but people can do intranasal infusions. Some of that gets into the brain, and they can ask, what does it do for behavior? This was one of the first reports that came out. This was published in Nature 2005, where it was, they used neuroeconomics games to show that intranasal oxytocin increased the amount of trust towards another. And um, we're going to just take you to this website because I think it's uh, Imagine for a moment that everyone trusted you. You will sell more, love more, and accomplish more than you ever imagined. Scientists have discovered a hormone that increases people trusting each other. It is a human hormone, oxytocin. So you can buy that product now. Um, so they tell you to put it on you before you go out on a business deal, and you'll get uh, the, the people will trust you more. But if you put it on you before you go on a business deal, who's going to trust who? It doesn't even make sense. So I don't think any of you would fall for that here. But this is we, we talked some about pheromones today. They they have an, a liquid trust enhanced version specifically designed to give a boost to the dating and relationship area of your life. Same this upgraded formula still contains the same great oxytocin, but also includes powerful pheromones. So you can attract the opposite sex and get them to trust you. Um, this is a study that came out around November of last year. They, 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 they were, this is from a German group that was asking, how does it affect men's uh, sort of relationship with women? They took men, half of them were single and half of them were in a monogamous relationship. And this was the man subject, and this is the what they call an, an attractive German experimenter. And they basically... <laughs> gave them either placebo or oxytocin, and, and she walked towards the guy, and he, told, he, he was told to you know, tell her to stop when it gets to be uncomfortable. Um, if you're single, it has no impact on where you tell her to stop. But if you are in a relationship, and you took intranasal oxytocin, you ask the woman to stop at a further, further distance away. So the, the author suggested, this was published in Journal of Neuroscience, that that this is a way of maintaining monogamous relationships by keeping attractive experimenters at a, part, at a distance from you. <laughs> and that if women want to keep their man faithful, they need to stimulate his oxytocin levels. Number of other studies have looked at um, what it does, and I'm just going to highlight a few of them. It increases the amount of time that we spend looking into the eyes. Remember I told you in mice, it increases, it increases the salience of social stimuli? Makes you pay attention to the social social stimuli. Well, the face is where we get our social information mostly. We spend more time looking into the eyes after oxytocin. It increases our ability to infer the emotions, to gather information from that face. By looking at the face, we can read the emotions better. Um, there was a study that just came out this morning showing that uh, men are much worse at reading emotions from women's faces than than women are. So maybe it's maybe a reason for that. Um, <clears throat> But it also does something that I think is really interesting in that it enhances socially reinforced learning. Okay, so in this study, they, they, they gave people a task that they had to learn how to perform. And they had a, a social reinforcement group where if they got it right, they got a person at them smiling, good job. Or if they got it wrong, they got a grimace. And what they found is that if they took 
this is placebo, and this is the oxytocin group. Oxytocin actually improved the performance in this if the reinforcer was social in nature. If they got the exact same information, but there was a green light or a red light, non-social reinforcers, it had no impact whatsoever. So it's enhancing socially reinforced learning. Okay? So actually, I think that um, based on all of this, beginning to see that maybe um, understanding the neurobiology of pair bonding in voles might have some useful application in disorders where there are disruptions in social behavior. And um, this is what we've been doing recently, thinking about how can we use all this information to improve treatments for social deficits in autism. The problem with autism, in terms of finding a treatment for it, is that it's a collection of disorders. Maybe hundreds or a thousand different genes can give rise to the same deficit in social phenotype. So we're not going to be able, likely, to develop drugs to target each one of those. But if we target the, the domain of social deficits, for example, we might be able to do that. And it turns out now there's, probably, I think there's four or five studies now um, showing that in autistic subjects, intranasal oxytocin does improve some aspects of their social functioning. It causes them to be able to read emotions better because it makes the social cues more important. It turns out it, it um, increases social reciprocity in a ball tossing game. Autistic uh, Asperger's syndrome uh, subjects tend not to really care too much if somebody throws the ball back to them or not, unless you give them oxytocin, and then they do. So it's very, uh, it's a relatively short acting thing. It's not, it's not a, like a cure, but it's a, during the time they're experiencing that, they, they do this. And if you think about it, you know, I, I told you that this oxytocin system evolved to promote maternal bonding. Think about a mother when she's nurturing her baby. She's getting that nipple stimulation that's causing the oxytocin neurons to fire. That's causing that baby to be the most important thing in, in the world. She's empathetic. She'll do anything to pre prevent that baby from getting hurt. She's making a real connection with that baby. And that, that probably also happens in more in, uh, to a lesser degree in many other uh, aspects of our social relationships. But the intranasal oxytocin, the problem is, is that not very much of it gets into the brain. So we've been thinking about ways of bypassing that and maybe pharmacologically creating the same situation in the mother, uh, sorry, in, the, in an autistic subject as happens when a mother is nursing, stimulating endogenous release. So what if you could have on oxy, if you knew something about oxytocin neurons, what receptors were on those neurons? Maybe you could have a drug that you could use to activate those receptors that could cross the blood brain barrier. And then you could cause oxytocin release within the brain in these areas where these receptors are and have a much more profound impact. And turns out, we looked in the literature, and there is such a drug. There's, there's several of them. Ecstasy is one, for example. Ecstasy stimulates oxytocin release. Um, but we've been looking at one. That's, uh, it's a, a myelinocortin-4 receptor agonist. That's the, the agonist uh, stimulates release. And if you block the receptors, you don't get the release within the brain. So here's a drug that we know stimulates oxytocin release. And we give it to voles, inject it peripherally, to put a male and female together, don't allow them to mate. This is the controls, no, no partner preference. The, um, the animals with the drug showed a very strong partner preference, even more robust than injections of oxytocin into the brain. So I think that this is proof of principle that this partner preference is, is a form of social learning. We're facilitating social learning because their brain is more receptive to the olfactory cues that are coming in and somehow are more attentive to that. And then they're able to change the neural connections in some way so that they form an association between the reward. And we can do that by infusing this drug. And also, if we separate them then and let them be apart for a week, so all the drug is gone, there's no more drug there, and we test them, they still show a partner preference. So that means that the information that they learned, the social information that they learned during that cohabitation period under, in the, under the influence of that drug is retained well after the drug is gone. So the implications of that, I think, have to do with the way we um, treat social deficits in autism now. We use um, things like applied behavioral analysis, where you have interactions between a therapist and a child, and you use reinforce social reinforcers to, ch to ch modify that child's behavior. But imagine if before that child went into that therapy session, you stimulated this brain system that allowed him to overcome the problems that he has already, so that now he looks into the therapist's eyes pays more attention, He's, she's more reinforcing to him, he learns from it. So what I think that maybe this is be useful for is 
improving the efficacy of behavioral therapies by simply engaging this part of the brain that's involved in social relationships. So basically, this is what I, I now uh, am excited about, the fact that now this, this pair bonding in a vol is really is an animal model that might prove useful for identifying uh, therapies that can be useful in autism. Um, so I get support from National Institute of Mental Health, National Science Foundation, and Autism Speaks, and this is my current lab. A lot of the work was done by people prior to that. And if you're interested in learning more about the chemistry of social relationships and sexuality and what we know from animal models and what, what do we know of that relates to human models um, and how our, so much of our behavior is affected by neurochemistry, um, this, uh, this book goes into detail about that. So thank you.